This is Jen Rubin, and this is Jen Rubin's Green Room. It's Tuesday, so we must have another excuse from Donald Trump as to why he cannot stand trial next week. The only thing left is, you guessed it, bone spurs. He is going to use every excuse in the book. Why? Because he fears, quite rightly, that he will be convicted. The law is pretty clear. If you falsify documents and you're doing so to help commit a crime, you are guilty. And that's what we have here. We have a lot of witnesses. We have a lot of documentary proof. We have a judge who knows what he's doing and there's no nonsense. We have a prosecutor who is determined to get it right. And that's why Trump is freaking out. That's why you have these nonstop rants on Truth Soldier. This is why every day is a different motion to throw him out, to transfer venue, to get some other excuse to delay, to delay. And now he's trapped. The walls are closing in. He can't do anything about it. So fingers crossed. I think this time next week, we'll probably be still in jury selection, but we'll be getting closer to an actual trial. Meanwhile, in other news, Donald Trump is now furiously backpedaling because who turns out that abortion bans, a nationwide abortion ban, is really stinky politics. It's terrible. People don't like it. It's cruel. It's inhumane. It's dangerous. Women around the country are suffering where there are bans and there are absolutely intolerable restrictions on the right to make health care decisions. So what does he do? He makes a little vi video and he sort of punts. He says, well, right now it's determined by the states. We like the states. The states are going to decide. And you know what the media does? They say, oh, he's given up on the nationwide ban. He's saying the states should decide it. Whoa. Reading comprehension, guys. Listening comprehension. Listen to what he said. He didn't say any of that. All he said was what the current law is, which states can decide, and the most irrational, most extreme states can actually ban an abortion before a woman knows she's pregnant and can leave out any exception for rape and incest. But he's not saying what you think he is saying or what the press is implying he's saying. He's not saying he would veto a nationwide ban. And what do you think he's going to put on his desk if Republicans are in control of Congress? They're going to put a nationwide ban on abortion on his desk. And of course he's going to sign it. That's the people that brought him to the dance. He's not going to spurn them then. So I think, again, we got to be really absolutely on our toes when we're looking at how the media portrays something he has said or done. It's to the point where you really have to go watch it for yourself and listen to it for yourself, because what he says and what they say he says are really two different things. Meanwhile, we still do not have a bill on the floor of the U.S. House to provide aid to Ukraine. And we're getting really close to the point at which there may be a point of no return, meaning already they've had to give back territory. Already lives have been lost. Cities have been turned over because the darn Republicans cannot figure out how to do the right thing and put on the floor a bill to support Ukraine. They don't even have to vote for it. They just have to put it on the floor and let the people who are the grownups, the people who are pro-democracy vote for it. So we'll see if that changes at some point this week. Um, I tend to think not, unfortunately. Now, in other news, it's very interesting. The abortion issue, although it is absolutely bedeviling Donald Trump, has really, I think, energized, galvanated both the president and the vice president. They are very sharp on this issue. And... That leads to a very nice development, which is a really good, quick response, a instantaneous response that the Biden administration and the Biden campaign have put together when Trump says and does these things. So when he gives this mealy mouth explanation for what his newest position on abortion is, they respond. They do a rapid response. They say, oh, no, that's not what he said. This is what he said. When Donald Trump behind closed doors is promising billionaires more tax cuts, they are there. 
when behind closed doors he is saying, we only want nice immigrants from Denmark and Norway. In other words, whites. They are there, and they are making the point. And that level of aggression and the level of uh, energy that we are seeing is something new for the Biden team. And we're also seeing the great imbalance in money. They have the organization and the ability to do that, to respond day after day after day. And as a result, the message finally, I think, will get through. We are just getting to the point where maybe some people are beginning to pay attention. I know you've been paying attention for four years. You've been paying attention since Donald Trump rode down that escalator. But the average person doesn't. The average person tunes into a presidential election a little bit before the presidential election, looks around, makes a decision, and then goes back to his or her life. That's not a negative thing. In a democracy, we have the luxury of worrying about our own lives and not making everything about politics. But you have to appreciate that repetition, a quick response, a definitive response is absolutely critical for the administration and for the campaign. And I will close on this, which is Israel. We had the great tragedy last week, which was the killing of the World Central Kitchen personnel, Jose Andres's angels. And the administration came down very hard on Bibi Netanyahu. They said, you must change or we will change our position on the war, meaning they might cut off support. Wouldn't you know, immediately there was a ramp up in aid getting through. Immediately there were plans being put into place finally for deconflicting. And oh, by the way, there are very few Israeli soldiers that are still left in Gaza. Why is that? Well, for one thing, they've gotten a lot of the fighters out of there. And for another, I would keep your eye on this never-ending refrain about Rafa. This is this great maneuver that they're going to go in. They're going to clean them out once and for all. Listen, Bibi has been saying this for weeks and for months. This is a way of perpetuating his own stay in power. This is a way of keeping his right-wing coalition together. This is a way of inciting progressives around the world to criticize him, which in turn makes his support at home stronger. I don't know that he's going to do anything in that regard. And we still have talks going on with the Egyptians, with the Qataris, with Hamas, with Israel and various incarnations, um, not all obviously in the room together. But I wouldn't give up entire hope that there may be a peaceful, a long in coming, an overdue diplomatic solution. And that's because the president carries a lot of weight. And using that voice, using it in a particularly sharp, emphatic way, I think it's had an impact. At least we hope it has. Democrats, I think, have gotten much better at communicating a message that Americans really care about. And in particular, I think they have really learned to talk about abortion. Thanks in large part to Kamala Harris, who I think set the tone perfectly right after Dobbs. They talk about this as an issue of freedom. And their recent ad in which they portrayed one of the tragic stories that comes from Donald Trump and his appointment of right-wing activists to the Supreme Court shows a Texas woman who had a miscarriage, but she almost died because of the ban in Texas and the fact she couldn't be treated until she was at death's door. And I think it's that understanding that an election is an emotional connection to the people you need to persuade. As self-evident as that might seem, that Democrats have begun to figure out. Listen, if it were a battle of white papers, of 13-point plans, Democrats would win every single election. But it really isn't. It's about an emotional connection that gives voters 
something that they want. That might not be a policy. That might be a sense of belonging. That might be a sense of security. That might be a sense of self-determination. But it's a connection. And people who are very good at understanding this, because they do it for a living, are writers, directors, producers. And we are so fortunate today to have one of them who not only is a great writer, director, producer, but also spends a lot of his free time trying to save democracy. Billy Ray is the screenwriter, among other things, of Hunger Games, of Captain Phillips. He is the artist behind the Nicole Kidman ad on AMC. He is a brilliant filmmaker, but he's also a brilliant message artist. And that's what we want to talk to him about today. Billy, welcome to the show. It's really a privilege to be here. My absolute privilege to have you. And you are the writer and director, I believe, of a film from a number of years back. You have lots of films, actually. But one in particular that I love because I'm fascinated by the Cold War, by spies, by counter spies and that was breach which was the story of robert hansen who i find of all of the spies the most bizarre character because he was this super catholic religious almost fanatic and yet he was a spy for the soviet union how did you come to understand him when you were doing this film what what was the key to understanding him I don't know that someone like that is actually understandable um, in the way that you and I could understand each other. Um, part of writing a character like that is to make the decision that our actions define us. In other words, we are what we do. At the end of the day, what he talked about was uh, piety and, and strict adherence um, to faith um, and an almost uh, obsessive interest in safeguarding our country um, and a very puritanical um, position on sex. And it turns out that he was spying for the Russians for 22 years uh, and making a lot of money doing it. He was sending off sex tapes of his wife to a friend of his in Germany. Um, he was risking other people's lives. And, and we know of three people that were killed absolutely, provably, uh, as a result of his actions, but the number may be 50. Um, he was a, just an absolute contradiction. So yeah. once you embrace that, you decide that his, his dialogue will be one thing and his actions will be something else. And the audience, if they ever want to, can turn off the sound and then figure out who he really was. Fascinating. Now, he was spying. There was overlap between him and Ulrich Ames. So there was a little bit of difficulty in figuring that out, that there were actually two spies. Um, but one of the things that struck me, and I just read a great book about a Cuban spy, um, Anna uh, Mortez, who was within the Defense uh, Intelligence Agency for like 20 years spying for the Cubans. Are we incapable of figuring out who's a spy and who's not? It's really kind of gotten to me. We have all these spy agencies. They have all kinds of super duper equipment. They have lie detectors. They have all kinds of rules. Can we just not figure out who's a spy and who's not? It's a little disconcerting to put it mildly. Um, I tend to be drawn to stories about American institutions. And what fascinates me about them is that, of course, the FBI or the CIA or the Atlanta Journal-Constitution or the New Republic magazine um, or NBC News, they're not actually institutions at all. They're groups of people who are stewards of an institution. And those people can have good judgment or bad judgment, good intentions or bad intentions. But it's not the buildings that are making the decisions. It's the people in them. Um, you know, the, the Department of Justice is a very different thing um, when run by Bill Barr than it is when run by someone who believes that we should actually follow the law. Right. And, it's a, and the post office is a very different thing run by Louis DeJoy than it is uh, when it's being run by someone 
who believes that the post office should not be uh, used as a political weapon. Um, again, it's the people. And so I look at a case like um, like uh, Hanson's, and I remember that he was the guy that was put in charge of finding the spy. Right. He's right. the reason the FBI kept looking towards the CIA, that and a certain institutional arrogance that the FBI was suffering under at that point. Um, remember, you know, the American government is made up of Americans and, and Americans, like all people, you know, they can be wrong. And in the case of Robert Hansen, um, similarly, in the case of Stephen Glass, who was another person that I had written about, who uh, was a, a journalist in the New Republic magazine, who made up a bunch of the stories he was writing about, they were able to deflect um, suspicion by being the most rigorous about detail and the most punishing of people around them if there was any suspicion of those people having uh, had a lack of candor. Um, they, they earned such medals for being um, rigorous about that that no one would have the nerve to think that they might be the problem. And that is fascinating. I had not till I looked at your filmography, made the connection between Robert Hansen and Glass. What do you think are the commonalities among the people who are duped by these sorts of personalities? Are they too trusting? Are they too willing to take uh, people's background or training as a proof of their um, worth? What are the common mistakes that people make who have been essentially defrauded in one way or other in the people they have hired? I think they all suffer from confirmation bias. Yeah. Um, in the case of Hansen, in the case of Stephen Glass, and I could extrapolate in the case of Donald Trump and what he was saying to voters in 2016, um, he was making a case that the people around him wanted to be true. And therefore, they required less convincing. In other words, you know, I spend a lot of time in the political space. It's, it's the unpaid half of my day. And I, I do messaging for about 85 sitting members of the House and Senate and another, I don't know, 35 that are running in this uh, cycle. And I talk to them a lot about public perception and messaging and storytelling. Um, it's astonishing to me how few politicians are good storytellers. I see that as so essential to what they do. Um, but they just don't seem to fall into it easily. But again, go look at what Donald Trump was saying in 2016 and who he was saying it to. Um, essentially, what he was doing was he was validating the hatreds that a certain section of our population had for the media, for um, institutions, for the coasts, for the liberals, um, and in some cases, for black people. Um, and he was saying, you're absolutely right to feel that way. Don't let them shame you for feeling that right that way. Those people are condescending to you. Those people are disadvantaging you. They are making fun of you and laughing at you and calling you deplorable. That was a story that that audience wanted to hear. So it wasn't tough to convince them. And I think that Robert Hansen and Stephen Glass worked in the same way. That's fascinating. And once you believe once you have bought the overarching message and the persona, you don't really care about the details so much. So even if you prove that the economy was worse under Donald Trump, that our uh, alliances were worse, you give them all this data, it's not going to make a difference because on an emotional level, it's not everyone, but the segment of his core supporters are glued to him, not because of policy positions, but because of this kind of call and recall cycle that they're in with him, where he reflects back their hatreds, their anxieties, and makes them feel powerful and makes them feel that they're part of something bigger than they otherwise would. I, I think that's absolutely true. Uh, I think there's another part of it, which is very human too, which is once you have bought in, um, it's really painful to step yes. out. Yeah. Um, it's very difficult to, um, to take that off ramp and say, oh, I could have been wrong about this guy because nobody is so-so on Donald Trump. You're either all in or you're not. And if you've been all in to then say, oh, I was that wrong, 
um, that takes a pretty special kind of person. Um, it'd be a, a, a very, very hard thing to do. And, um, and, and the group of people that have put him or that did at one point put him in power, um, some of them have fallen off. Uh, yep. You know, interesting. Um, in 2016, he won 80% of the evangelical vote in Michigan. And then this group called uh, uh, Vote Common Good, two pastors who gave up their, um, their parish in order to just go to evangelical voters and try to give them an off-ramp, um, try to talk to them, one Christian to another, about Trump and what Trump actually represented. They just started hitting that state in a bus, um, despite the pandemic. And four years after 2016, they had knocked Trump's evangelical vote down in Michigan from 80 percent to 71 percent in 2020. And if you look at every other demographic group in Michigan, it had all stayed the same. Fascinating. Just losing nine percent of the evangelical vote swung it's that huge. It's huge. It is um, huge. It is huge. That's how thin Trump's margin is. It's why I am not afraid of Trump as an electoral force in in November. Obviously, we're going to have to work hard um, to make sure that people understand what the stakes are. Uh, but I, I feel that if you can just get a percentage of the people yes. who supported him to reexamine, um, that's all it takes. Right. You know, it's interesting, your comment about people not wanting to, in essence, own up to the fact that they've been conned. There was a apocalyptic cult of some type maybe it was like the mayan calendar people and they had picked a date that was the end of the world and the end of the world came and went so researchers and other people went back to them and said well do you now like have you given up on the cult now that it's passed no no you have to understand we miscalculated and they will give a involved explanation even then, when the world was literally supposed to end, they would rather double down, come up with some cockamamie other explanation than simply say, okay, maybe it wasn't like the end, end of the world. That's just, I think, human nature. So there's certain people who are not going to be weaned off. But I'm intrigued by the one-on-one -on -one mechanism. How much do you think, since you've spent a lot of time in politics, of politics is broadband, TV, online, free media, and how much do you think is really much more localized, person on person, parish by parish, neighbor to neighbor? Well, I think you. I think both are vital. Um, I have a friend who uh, was trying to help Doug Jones when Doug was running against Roy Moore. Yep. Um, was that 2017, 2018? I forget. 2017, which... 2017, okay. a special election. Yeah. Right. Okay. So Roy Moore had been accused of, of, uh, all sorts of sexual, um, misconduct, misconduct. That's the perfect word for it with, you know, 13 and 14 year old girls. So, um, my friend got into, uh, an online chat group with a bunch of Alabamian, um, evangelical women posing as one of them. Yep. And they just talked to each other all day. Right. And, and he never said a word about Doug Jones, never said a word. He just validated their feelings. And then three days before the election, he wrote into this chat group, you know, y'all, I'm really starting to get troubled about Roy Moore. I mean, those girls were 14. And I think I'm just going to write in the name Jesus Christ on the ballot. And they all wrote back, me too. Wow. Okay. Um, that's powerful. Yes. That's powerful. Yes. That's local. Um, and that is one of the ways in which you have to wage a campaign. But then there's a much bigger picture thing. And it's something that I talk to candidates about all the time, which is, what is it that makes a conservative conservative? And that's important, of course, because you're trying to win independent voters. Right. Twenty five percent of the electorate is still movable. Independent vo voters tend to lean conservative and yes. they tend to be cranky towards the party that's in power, which right now is nominally the Democrats. Right. OK, so you need to find a new language to speak to people who think like conservatives do, because Democrats tend to speak in a frequency that only liberals can hear. Right. Um, 
and then they're mystified that they don't win independent votes. Right. So here's here's the 411 on this, okay? What makes a conservative a conservative on a psychological level, what binds them together as a political group is their shared fear of chaos. That is what has been aimed at every single uh, Republican voter and independent voter for as long as I've been uh, alive by Republican candidates. And by the way, it's the reason why those people are clinging to the Mayan calendar. It's the reason why QAnon stays QAnon and keeps recategorizing um, and repurposing its own failed theories. And it's why people vote conservative. By that, I mean that in 1988, the Willie Horton ad, which ended Michael Dukakis's campaign, essentially yes. said, if you vote for Michael Dukakis, a black convict on furlough is going to come murder your family, right. right? Democrats are soft on crime, chaos. Then after 9-11, Democrats are soft on terror, chaos. Now it's Democrats are for open borders. Democrats are for burning cities. Democrats want to defund the police. Democrats don't care if your son becomes your daughter. Chaos, chaos, chaos. If you give a conservative the choice between authoritarianism and what they perceive to be chaos, they will pick authoritarianism every time. They're doing it right in front of us. And so what Democrats need to understand is that conservatives, because they are frightened by chaos, um, they like borders around things. They like borders around countries. They like borders around gender. They like borders around sexuality. What Democrats must understand is that in order to reach that voter, we have to rebrand who we are so that we don't look like agents of chaos which means we have to redefine what chaos is. That chaos is actually people showing up at a, a polling place with an AR-15. Chaos is January 6th. Remember when there were 30 cars backed up in that hospital parking lot because Trump didn't have an answer for COVID? That's chaos. We just want to govern. We're the guys where when the I-95 collapses in, in Pennsylvania and they say it'll take a year to fix, we get it done in 16 days. That's what we do. We just build bridges. We're not here to reinvent the world. We're just here to govern robustly and effectively so that you can be free to live your lives. That's the opposite of chaos. And that's what Democrats need to sell. That is fascinating. And of course, when you look at the three stools of the original Reagan coalition, which is essentially the modern political uh, conservative movement, it was fear of communism, chaos. It was fear of a regulatory, aggressive state that was going to take all your money away and make your business fail, so chaos. And it was traditional family values because we were undergoing a period, an ongoing period since the 1960s, of social change, reinvention, cross-culturalism, multiculturalism. And so... In a sense, all three of those, although they had a policy name on them, speak to your issue of chaos. That's right. I mean, that, that's the thing that, look, I, I've been studying this since the, the night that, uh, that uh, Trump was elected, when I went into the tank so hard. It was, yes. I couldn't eat or sleep. I needed to yes. be mad. It was pretty bad. Um, and I've been studying this ever since. I put myself at the feet of people who understood political messaging, and I learned it. And it really comes down to something very simple. All elections come down to two things. What do people want? What are they afraid of? Okay. What people are afraid of right now is chaos. And every poll is telling us that the issue in this election will be stability, security, whether that's border security, whether that's neighborhood security or paycheck security. People are feeling a little out of control, despite the fact that the economy is absolutely roaring. Um, they are feeling they have been fed a lot of bullshit for the last eight years and it's had, you know, it has accrued. OK, so once we know that, that's the thing they're afraid of. OK, we need to talk about how Republicans I'm sorry, I don't use the word Republican anymore, how the yeah. radical right yeah. actually keeps promoting and propagating that chaos. And then we have to just, well, then we have to supply the thing that they most want, which is freedom. If you poll Americans on what virtues mean the most to them, freedom is number one, and it's not close. Freedom yeah. outpolls justice as a virtue in America by 22 points, yeah. which will come as no shock to any black person who's been saying forever, hey, justice, justice, while white America's been saying, well, yeah, justice. I mean, it's important, 
But what I really want is the freedom to say stupid shit and not be called a racist. Right. Right. Freedom. And, every and just just to finish the point, yeah. the stack of guns stopped being a safety issue and started being a freedom issue. Well, someone could walk into Sandy Hook and shoot 20 kids and not change the law. The second mask and vaccines stopped being a health issue and started being a freedom issue, things got really weird. Americans don't want their freedoms taken away, and it's why um, abortion is the issue to run on, because it is a freedom that was taken away by conservatives. Absolutely, and that's where I was going. I said it when Dobbs came down. I've said it since. I think there has been just a grotesque underestimation of the power of that issue because a mostly male media, mostly male political structure does not understand the level of panic, the level of anger of women who look at this and say, I'm going to get pregnant accidentally and I'm not going to be able to do anything about it. That is the ultimate loss of control. That is the ultimate sense that you are not your own person that you're a victim of other forces. And it's interesting, the first person to pick up on that dynamic and to use the freedom model rather than the choice model or the healthcare model was Kamala Harris. She got it. And if you look back, her first speeches right after Dobbs were freedom, freedom, freedom. And I do think that, I'm interested in your take, that the pro-choice movement has sort of figured that out. They were so tongue-tied for so long in terms of how to talk about it. Did they want to say abortion? Did they not want to say abortion? Were they saying reproductive freedom? What the heck is that, most people would say? Um, that they kind of forgot this is about freedom, like the most incredible kind of freedom, whether to have a child or not. So I think they have gotten better. Um, what do you tell Democrats about the abortion issue in terms of messaging, in terms of highlighting that it is the ultimate loss of control, the ultimate loss of freedom when the government can run around saying when you can have kids and when you can't? Um, what I say to them is that if I were debating a Republican candidate um, in a televised debate, um, Let's just say that I was uh, uh, Sherrod Brown. Right. I was running against, I forget the name of that dipshit that he's running against. <laughs> yes, you know? who apparently faked being shot in the arm. But, you know, well, the, yeah. Okay. But if I were Sherrod Brown, I would say, hey, um, will you take my 90 seconds on this one? Because I need you to explain something to me. Um, I literally don't understand what it is that you're proposing as policy. Can you please tell me? how government mandated pregnancy is going to work as, as policy. Cause that's what we're talking about now. That's what that woman in Texas was dealing with. Yes. She didn't want to have the child. The state of Texas was going to make her have the child. That's government mandated pregnancy. Remember, we don't have to defend abortion anymore. We spent yeah. 50 years playing defense. Now they have to defend taking it away. So if I were Sherrod, I would say, okay, let's take my 20 year old unmarried niece. She's pregnant. It's too late to have a conversation with her about abstinence. Okay, she's not ready to have the child emotionally, mentally, or financially, but the state of Ohio is going to make her have that child. Tell me how that works as policy. Are we going to take, um, are we gonna create a new layer of police bureaucracy to follow women like that around and make sure they don't cross state lines or go into Canada to get the healthcare that they want? Okay, that sounds expensive. So how many bridges aren't we going to build? How many schools aren't we going to build? Which is ironic because the kids are going to need schools. Oh, wait. Okay, so you're saying we're not going to create a new layer of bureaucracy to do that. We're going to take existing cops, pull them off of what they're doing now so they can follow my 20-year-old unmarried pregnant niece around. Okay. Um, okay. Well, then how many rapes aren't they going to investigate? How many robberies aren't they going to solve because they're busy doing this? Can you just tell me how it works? Because I don't get it. And then the opponent will say, well, sanctity of life. And then you interrupt. You go, wait a minute. I didn't ask you to defend it. I asked you to explain it. Because when you write a law like that and you institute a policy, you need to say how it's going to be paid for, who's going to be in charge, 
What are the regulations that are involved with it? Can you please take my 90 seconds and just explain to me what the world of government mandated pregnancy looks like? Exactly. What is that candidate going to say? Yes. And that's why uh, as often as I can, so long as my editors don't get frustrated with me, I use the term, oh. not abortion ban, but forced birth. Because yeah. that's what it is. You it's are a forcing. Dated pregnancy. That's what it is. Yes. And I think the Republicans, this is the proverbial dog that caught the bus. It was so helpful for them when it was out of reach because they could say these things. They could rail at Republicans. They could make up all this hullabaloo about, you know, abortions the minute after birth or the minute before birth or whichever it was. But now that they have it, I think the reality, which I give Democrats credit for, usually they're not this adept, in bringing forth these women, in bringing forth the chaos that they have created, I think has been effective. Listen, we've never had a higher percentage of people supporting no restrictions on abortion or, same question, different answer, no or fewer restrictions on abortion. In other words, the purist position never been higher and the general pro-choice position never been higher. And that's because people don't like this. They don't like this crap. I, I, would, I, I would actually argue that it speaks to a much bigger picture in America. There are so many lies in American politics. And, you know, we talk about uh, 2020 and the big lie yeah. uh, that, that, that has fueled MAGA. But I actually think there's a bigger lie in American okay. politics which is that we are a divided nation. We're not, and it's, and it's actually not close. You know, when they, put, um, when they put minimum wage on the ballot in Florida, it got 60%, this core democratic idea. They put it on the ballot in Arkansas, it got 62, and in Missouri, it got 67. This, again, a core democratic idea in states where Democrats routinely get their asses kicked. Uh, Americans, two thirds of them agree with us on, on choice. They agree with us on guns. Um, by the way, if you stop calling it universal background checks and start calling it violent history checks, 95% of <laughs> yeah. come with you, including 73% of NRA members. They agree with us overwhelmingly on protecting Social Security and Medicare. They agree with us on the environment. They agree with us on um, um, uh, decriminalizing cannabis. They agree with us on everything by two thirds. So why are we not winning two thirds of the elections? Um, I, I think there's a really, really simple reason for that, which goes back again to 2016, if I may. Um, there were 6.2 million Americans in 2016 who had voted for Obama and then voted for Donald Trump. 6.2 million flip voters. 1.3 million of them lived in three states, Wisconsin, Michigan, Pennsylvania, which is why the blue wall crumbled. 1.3 million flip voters in those three states. So somebody very smart did a deep dive and said, okay, who are these people and why did they have such a massive swing? Right. Here's what they found out. On average, that voter, that flip voter, works two and a half jobs, commutes three hours per day, and thinks about politics four minutes per week, okay, per week. So no, you're not gonna get them on an argument about uh, the filibuster or the debt ceiling, okay? Yes. It's just not where they are. You go up to that voter in Scranton, in Eau Claire, in Lansing, right? Pick the city, the hard scrabble city in any of those states. He's working two and a half jobs. He's commuting three hours a day. He's thinking about politics four minutes per week, right? I guarantee you he's taking his medication every other day to make 30 pills last 60 days. His kid's school is falling apart. His mom's in a nursing home. You go up to that guy and say, you've got white privilege, and I don't like your pronoun. What do you think he's going to say to you? Yes. Whether he has white privilege or not, whether you don't like his pronouns or not, it's got nothing to do with his life. And you're going to send him running, screaming into the arms of the nearest Republican. Because we as Democrats insist that people celebrate things that they've just learned how to tolerate. And they're not the same thing. Like if you were to ask that same voter gay rights, he'd say, okay, I don't care. I know a gay guy. He works in HR. He's fine. I'm fine. It's fine. But right. don't tell me if I don't march in a parade that I'm a homophobe. 
Right. But we as Democrats say, oh, wait a minute. You said pregnant women instead of pregnant persons. You're done. Right. We're canceling you. Wait a minute. You said breastfeeding and not chest feeding. Done. We, right? So the way that Democrats have to deal with that, in my personal opinion, is that they have to call out the left more often. They have to throw the flag themselves. When the San Francisco Board of Education says something as absurd as, we're not going to name schools after Abraham Lincoln anymore. He wasn't woke enough. That's when Democrats right. need to say, that doesn't speak for me. The left is a part of my party. It's not the sum of my party. It shouldn't be the face of my party. If you do that, if you aim for the big middle where the votes are, then you get power. And then you can do whatever you want for anybody. Right. This is, of course, straight out of the Bill Clinton handbook. He was the one who said it's better to be strong and wrong than weak and right. That for a segment of the American population, strength, being in control, being an authority figure matters. And he, of course, was famous for his sister soldier message. And he was the one who brought welfare reform because Republicans had railed about welfare queens, and we could say that's racist, and it was. But he was the one who said, yeah, work is a good idea. I think we need people working. Um, and he was one of the most successful Democratic presidents in my lifetime. So it's not like you and I are suggesting some weirdo kind of crazy formula that has never worked. No. In fact, whenever Democrats win, this is what they do. Who are the two of the most successful Democrats who win th running 30 points below the ticket? Sherrod Brown and John Tester, because they right. talk like normal human beings. John Tester is a real farmer with three fingers that he's happy to show up. He talks, he acts like a real human being. And he talks about things that his neighbors understand. And he doesn't make a pretense of being woke or being um, perfect in the eyes of his far left. That's a danger for him. He would love it if AOC called him out every day. He would love it. Listen, I think personally, if you are a man trapped in the body of a woman and you want to and you become pregnant and you call yourself a pregnant person, I would fight for your right to do so. Of course, I've got nothing but empathy for that circumstance. But I don't believe that we as Democrats should tell other people, oh, no, 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 you must say it this way, yeah. because then we are condescending. Yeah. And, and when you break down what most House elections come down to, most voters in swing districts will tell you it was really simple. The Republican was an asshole, the Democrat was an elitist, and the asshole never made me feel dumb. Yeah. And we have to embrace that. Um, you have to, running for office is not unlike writing a movie. You have to locate where your audience is emotionally and then guide them to where you want them to be. And, and it's, it's nuanced, but it's really not that difficult right. if you're paying attention to it. Now, you said something I think that was really, really important, which is you have to redefine chaos. Mm -hmm. And Trump is a chaos machine, of course. What are some ways, listen, he's on trial in four courtrooms. He has had these massive civil judgments. He goes off the deep end 18 times a day on Truth Social. He let COVID get out of hand. He orchestrated January 6th. And yet a whole bunch of the country thinks, okay, he's fine. He's stronger than Joe Biden. What do Democrats do to turn that around? How can they confront the fraudulent Trump and point out he's a crazy, out of his mind, uncontrollable force of nature that will blow away your house and your job and your life? Well, first of all, any conversation about Trump is a good one. Yeah. Um, if we're talking about Trump, Biden's going to win. Yeah. Uh, that's, that's where that. we focus. But let me give you sort of a, a, a big frame here. There's a, a brilliant novelist named Greg Hurwitz, um, who is a good personal friend and, and a colleague of mine. And he wrote a book once about a cult. And he spent a lot of time 
in cults and learned about the deprogramming of people from cults. And the, the golden rule, which Democrats do not fucking get, is that when you're dealing with a cult member, you never say the word cult. <laughs> Ever. Because one of the tenets of a cult is, hey, anyone who, <laughs> anyone who disagrees with you is going to tell you you're in a cult. That's how you know that they're a danger. Okay? And it backs them into tribal corners. So the first thing you do is you don't say you're in a cult and I want to help you. What you say to someone like that is, hey, five years ago, where did you picture your life going five years ahead? Are you there? Are you where you thought you'd be five years ago? And you start there. Okay? So the way that I talk to candidates and electives about Donald Trump is to say, listen, I get what was fun and what was funny about Donald Trump in 2016. I get it. You didn't feel seen or heard by your government. And along comes this guy running for president who says, I'm going to blow the government up. I get why that was appealing. I, I totally understand. Um, here's the problem. He ran on four promises that he made to you. Your healthcare will get better and cheaper. I will bring back manufacturing. Mexico will pay for the wall. I will drain the swamp. Those were the four promises. Okay. He had a Republican Supreme Court, a Republican Senate, a Republican House, and he went 0 for 4 on those promises. 0 for 4. Which either means they were bad ideas or he was the wrong executive. But either way, you deserve better. Right? So it's all about that same idea of, is this where you thought this would all go when you were voting for him? Um, it's the same way that you would talk to a cult member. Now, there are, I talk to this, about this to readers all the time. There is a certain segment of the population that is unreachable for Democrats. We yes. get that. Just like there is a segment of the Democratic Party which is unreachable. But the area of contentious um, free articles that are shifting around is larger than some people uh, think. And Sarah Longwell, who I think is brilliant at this, has come up with the idea of a permission structure, giving Republicans a permission structure to shift over. So she has ordinary people, not Hollywood actors, take little videos explaining that they voted for Trump once or twice, and now they're not going to. Is that an effective way? Do you need people from within the cult to deprogram, or can you do it from the outside? Can you come at them from someone who did not vote for Donald Trump and think Donald Trump is terrible? I think you need to separate two issues. Um, one is, I believe that 30% of our country has always been crazy. Yes. Always. Go back and look at what Americans were saying before the Civil War. 30% of this country was nuts. Yeah. Go back and look at what Americans were saying before World War II, the America First movement. 30% of the country, nuts. Yeah. Um, Richard Nixon, the day he left office, his approval rating was 29%. Yep. Yeah. There's nuts. a group of people that cannot be moved, and it's a waste of time to try. Okay. Donald Trump can have that 30%. It's fine. That means 70% of the electorate is reachable. The people that you can reach who are, like I said, independents who lean conservative or Republicans who were Republicans because um, they loved Reagan and McCain and Eisenhower, you can absolutely reach those people with people who have stepped out because it's not like they're leaving a cult. These are people who are just like you. You know, there's this great candidate running in um, – in California, in Riverside County, in Palm Springs. His name is Will Rollins. He's running against a, a Trumpy dinosaur named Ken Calvert, who's been there for 32 oh, years. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um, Ken Calvert's personal wealth has gone up $21 million <laughs> in the 32 years that he's been serving in Congress. Okay. That's an issue. But Will Rollins put out this ad which said, hey, my grandparents were Republicans. My grandparents loved Eisenhower. They loved Reagan. That was, those were their heroes. And they taught me that what the Republican Party stood for was smaller government, law and order, personal accountability, 
and hawkishness on Russia. I'm a Democrat because the Republican Party now stands for none of those things. Right. Right. And that's the argument to make. If you are a Republican because you liked Reagan and McCain, you need to look at the Democratic Party. Will Rollins as a candidate, um, I believe that's California 41. Will Rollins as a candidate is closer to that Republican ideal. Absolutely. Than Ken Calvert is. Absolutely. And that's a re-education too, that yes, I do believe conservative leaning independents and former Trump voters, they can create that permission structure in the same way that Vote Common Good did in Michigan in working with evangelical voters who's, who had conflated their religious identity and their political identity and believed that voting for a Democrat at any time was a violation of their belief in Christ. Right. And they needed someone who was just as Christian as they were to say, let's look at it a slightly different way. Right. And that can be done. There are innumerable examples because the 30% of the country that is crazy has elected about 100% of the Republican majority in the House of Representatives, thanks right. to gerrymandering, of those people who are batshit crazy. Um, and that's not minor figures. They're central to the Republican governing coalition. Republicans used to use the San Francisco liberal and put Nancy Pelosi on everything. Does it work the other way where you put Marjorie Taylor Greene and Mike Johnson and all the crazy bunnies and say, that's the Republican Party when you're running against a Ken Calvert, when you're running against a whoever the guy is in uh, Ohio that shared Brown? Does that work, that association? It works for fundraising, um, but it doesn't bring any uh, independent voters over towards you because um, it just sounds like you're screaming. Yeah. I, I think it's really, really important, again, to locate the audience emotionally, right? Where are they? If you're that guy in Scranton or Lansing or Eau Claire, you're not thinking about politics. Every time I talk to um, someone who's running for the House or, or someone who's already a member of the House um, who's running for re-election, and I talk to a lot of them, and I say to them, how often when you knock on doors, when you're talking to people on their front porches or in their living rooms or at a county fair or a town hall or a fish fry, how many times do they say to you, it's really important to me that you win because I want to make sure Democrats take back the House? And they say, never. Yeah. They're always talking about local issues, right? right? It's water rights or it's w w fill in the blanks, right. given... given um, given a, a, a particular district, right? People aren't thinking about politics in the way that DC thinks about politics. And so, yeah, I could, I, I'm in Los Angeles. I could walk into any living room in West, in West LA right. and talking about Marjorie Taylor Greene and, and raise some money for somebody. Yeah, I can do that. But I'm not gonna, that's not how we're gonna win Michigan. Right. It's not how we're gonna win Arizona, Georgia, Pennsylvania and Wisconsin, and I think we're gonna win all five of those states, by the way, but yeah. we're not gonna do it by screaming about Marjorie Taylor Greene. What we're gonna do is, and I tell this to every single one of my, um, uh, my candidates, if you frame your election as, a, as a, a, a race between a Democrat and a Republican, you can lose. Right. If you frame it as a race between an American and an extremist, everybody knows what bucket they're supposed to be in. Right. So you've got to be talking about extremism as an extension of chaos. What is the thing that we are actually pitching? It's the thing that we actually believe in. Right. Community over chaos. Votes over violence. Laws over lies. Books over bans. Truth over tantrums. I, I could alliterate all day, yes. but you make my point. We are actually where the middle is, and we have to make sure that America understands that. I I think that's absolutely indisputable. The Reagan folks put out a ad that shows the woman from Texas who is literally going through the baby things that she wasn't able to use. Um, and 
forget whether it's a just on screen or a audio uh, that explains that she nearly died because Texas had outlawed abortion. It was extremely powerful and gripping. Is that too much to get those swinging voters? Is that too geared to the assumption of progressives, or is that the right place to be? I haven't seen any data about the effectiveness of that ad, so I would just be guessing on this one. This yeah. is not something that I have any, you know, polling on. Right. Uh, that sounds pretty good to me. Yep. <laughs> um, I thought so too. I, I just think, in general, if we're talking about choice, we're in the right place. Yeah. You know, um, 25% of this electorate is still movable. And of that 25%, 81% is really pissed off about Dobbs. Yeah. So you keep talking about that. They have nowhere to go but right. the Democratic Party. Right. And, and, and by the way, I would also say there's this thing called breaking the frame. Have you ever y- yes. heard that? Yes. Yeah. Okay. So breaking the frame essentially means that when someone uh, asks a question of you that's a trap, you don't answer it. You reject the premise of the question. Right. So famously, 2002, 2003, W wants to invade Afghanistan and Iraq. He sends Dick Cheney out on all the Sunday morning talk shows mm-hmm. to defend it. On every single talk show, Cheney's asked the same question. What's the cost of going in terms of men, materiel and money? And every time Cheney breaks the frame, he says, what's the cost of not going? Right. Right. Now, conversely. But by the way, had he answered the real question, it would have been, mm, I think yeah. been 20 years, <laughs> yes. I think spending seven trillion dollars and losing 5000 American lives. Who's in? Yeah. Right. He didn't want right. to make that. He didn't want to tell the truth. So right. he broke the frame. Conversely, go back to October 7th, 2016, um, the Access Hollywood tape, right? A couple days later, Hillary's on a debate stage opposite Trump. They ask her the first softball question about um, the Access Hollywood tape. She does 90 seconds on sexual predators and doesn't change anybody's mind. Right. Imagine if she had broken the frame. Imagine if her answer had been, I'm not going to comment on the Access Hollywood tape. The world can make up its own mind about Donald Trump because my focusing on that tape won't get one of you a job, won't get one of you health care, it won't build one school or clean one river. And that's what my administration is going to be about. That's what I'm going to spend my 90 seconds on. She wins by 10 points. Yeah. But she couldn't fucking do it. Yeah. Right? Yeah. And it, by the way, it's hard for fair-minded people to break the frame because they believe if they're asked a direct question, they're they doing answer it. Yes. a direct answer. Exactly. But in their business, like in my business, if you're explaining, you're losing. You're losing. You know, right? that, that so we need to keep breaking the frame when they keep trying to drag us into conversations that are false, right. that we want to have. We got to break the frame. That's so funny. In my prior life, I was a lawyer. And when I talk to political types or I talk to media types, I say to them, you know, a media interview is not a fucking deposition. You're not under oath and you don't have to answer the question. No one is going to say, objection. He didn't answer the question. I mean, sometimes they will after like the 10th time, but you're going to get everything you want to say in there. This, I think people have more control over the message by people. I mean, candidates, advocates, than they think they do. Because the questioners and the forum that they're in is so weak, it cannot control them if they're really bold. That's why Trump was so effective when he did the debates in 2016. He not only broke the frame, he broke the picture, he broke the furniture, (laughs) he broke the house, he broke the roof, he broke everything. Um, So I think Democrats really can take control of their message. And I will tell you, I saw it in 2018. Simon Rosenberg and I, I think, were the only humans on the planet who never bought the red wave because we both saw the actual data and we saw what women were doing and saying. I interviewed six Democratic women in swing states. Actually, I called six. The one who didn't respond wound up losing. I'm not going to tell you who they are. The other five, all I talked to, interviewed, and all five of them were leaning into the abortion issue. This was right after Dobbs. And that's how you win. That's how you win. Of course it's how you win. And uh, So I'll give you an example, okay? Because I was just, uh, I I had uh, Zooms with two separate candidates yesterday, both running in California. And we talked about breaking the frame. And we talked about how the women that these two 
candidates are running against, um, will both try to tag them with some sort of pro-trans yeah. bullshit. Okay. Um, and they're going to try to make it look like Democrats are fixated on this issue, which of course is the opposite of the truth. <laughs> we don't care. They're the ones who keep bringing Republicans it are completely fixated on this issue. So here's how I would answer it. Okay. If I were running against, oh, let me just pull some names out of my hat. Um, young Kim or Michelle Steele, right. uh, two bananas uh, right. MAGA candidates uh, running out here in Orange County. Right. If I were on a debate stage opposite them and they started to throw some trans bullshit at me, I would say, you know, Michelle, you know, Young, um, I've had the privilege of during campaigning of seeing every corner of this district. And people talk to me on their porches, in their living rooms, you know, at town halls, uh, which you guys don't do, by the way. But um, people talk to me about the cost of living and choice and um, how our environment looks and the cost of prescription drugs. Um, they talk to me about all kinds of things. They talk to me about border security. No one's ever asked me about trans issues, ever. <laughs> but you think that your job as elected representatives, instead of dealing with those issues, which will meaningfully affect the lives of your constituents, you think that the best use of your time is to go with Jim Jordan and follow a bunch of middle schoolers into their locker rooms to inspect their genitals. Okay, I don't get that as a fixation. I don't know why it seems so important to you, but that's what you want to do? You're, you think your job is to keep somebody off a swim team? Okay, when you're ready to talk about the cost of living, border security, our environment, choice, and healthcare, come join the conversation. We'll be happy to have you. Until then, stay in your fixation and your obsession We'll talk after November. That's how I would answer that question. Um, and I think Democrats get that now. I think they do. I think they've come a long way. They've got a long way still to go. Um, but uh, it sounds like they're getting some good advice. Uh, I look forward to hearing Democrats break the frame and say the right things from here on out. Thank you so much for coming on the show. It's been great. And uh, I think Democrats should listen to you. Uh, it's such a privilege, and uh, thank you for letting me come on here and just opine so wildly and freely. <laughs> That's it. what we're here for. Good seeing you, Billy. Thank you, Jen. And that was Billy Ray. Wow, really powerful, wasn't it? I think he has nailed the issue, which is if Democrats don't talk like crazy people, they will win this election. And the good news is they have a president who doesn't talk like a crazy person. They have exactly the right candidate for the message that he is advocating, which is safety, security, normalcy, freedom. That's Joe Biden. That's what Joe Biden is running on. He is running on the freedom to decide when you want to have a child, not when the government's going to force you to have one. He is running on defending against our enemies, not allowing Putin to run around the world attacking his neighbors. He is running on an economic recovery that allows you to not only get back to your office, get your paycheck, but actually outpace inflation with the wage increases that you're getting. He is the perfect candidate to convey the sense of security, of confidence, of normalcy. And Donald Trump is the perfect candidate to be the chaos candidate. That's what he is. He's chaos nonstop. His tweets are chaos. His court appearances are chaos. The kind of government he wants, firing everyone in the civil service, using the military to suppress dissent, sicking the Justice Department on his enemies, all of this stuff is crazy, out of control, scary stuff. And if Biden adequately conveys that he's the guy who reopened the schools from COVID, he's the guy who made everyone who could get a shot and let them go back to work, 
he's the one who's going to stand up to the thugs around the world then he will win and i think he will win comfortably if we get into some arcane argument about an issue that americans don't really care about or that republicans have managed to ridicule it will be very hard to win and i think biden has been handed a couple gifts he was handed a bipartisan tough immigration bill. That's what they wanted. That's what they keep saying they want. Biden was for it. Trump was against it. That is a gift from the political gods. And he should talk about it every single day. When we are fighting a battle for democracy around the world, and we can give arms and support to Ukraine, so not a single American soldier has to lose his life in Ukraine. And we, by the way, can help decimate half of the Russian military. And Trump wants to emulate Putin, wants to emulate his thuggish buddies. Well, that's also a gift from the political gods. So be optimistic. I think this one is going to go well, perhaps better than you imagined. And I think Billy's right. Time to break the frame. Time to talk about things Americans care about. And time to get off the couch and not be immersed in scrolling and polls and doomsday scenarios, but actually go out and work for some of these candidates. If you enjoyed this program and you enjoyed our other programs, please tell your friends. They can follow and subscribe at YouTube, Spotify, Apple Podcasts, or wherever they get their podcasts. Bye-bye.